Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. This is your host, Oppenheimer, as they call me, because the way I've been farting these days is like I'm dropping nuclear bombs. Uh, on a more serious note, thank you all for 10,000 subscribers. It means a lot to me. Incredible feedback still on the channel, which I'm really happy about, and uh, I hope to do more collaborations in the future. The more subscribers I have, the less foot pictures I have to sell. So that may be some bad news for some of you, but for me, probably a nice thing. Anyways, let's get into some systems design. Today we'll be talking about stream joins. All right, so like I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about stream enrichment. So stream enrichment really just means instead of taking an individual stream event and passing it around through all of these other parts of our system, what we're actually aiming to do is augment that event with more information from other pieces of our system. So again, so far what we've looked at is, you know, just having one producer, one consumer and a broker connecting them. But the reality of the situation is that data is often coupled, there are relationships between the data, and a lot of times we might publish an event to one consumer, but on that consumer we might want to you know, add other pieces to that data so that we can pass it to other places within our system downstream and you know, have that piece of data be more useful. So really what stream enrichment effectively means is we want to perform a join on our events with some other pieces of data. So basically, what are some examples of joins that we might be doing in streams? We're gonna take a look at three and talk about all three of those. So the first is going to be stream stream joins. So the unique thing about these are that we're actually matching events from two streams. And the example that I have absolutely plagiarized from designing a data intensive applications is basically one where we've got one source or one producer node that is publishing a bunch of search terms. Let's imagine I go into Google and I type something like tissues. And a second that every single time I click a link from Google is going to publish the link that I clicked so that we can later do some aggregation down the line and look at how certain search terms and links interact with one another. You know whether a certain search term might lead to more clicks or anything like that, or the average number of clicks per search term, anything like that, doesn't really matter. So an example of a link clicked would be amazon.com. So let's imagine then that for both of those producers, they're publishing events, right? This would be an example of an event. And those events have a key, in this case it would be the user ID. And basically we wanna be able to join those events by key. But of course, it's not enough to basically just handle events and then say, hey, have we seen an event from the other producer that matches these? Why? Because, well, they don't come in at the same time. There's some arbitrary amount of time where one event is valid, right? You know, let's say we wanted to hold on to this guy for five minutes or something. Well, where are we actually going to hold it? Because if we don't hold it, how are we ever gonna match it with any other type of event? We need to store it somewhere. And so typically what we'll actually do is go ahead and store that in the consumer. So let's imagine that this guy over here, user 22 and tissues came in first. Well, what we would actually do is cache that guy on our consumer so that when 22 Amazon comes in, we can say, oh wait, Let's look at our hash map. Is there any key with the value 22? Oh, there is, let's join them. And then of course from there, the whole point is to enrich this data, augment it, and then send it to other parts of our system. We can put it into something like this over here, which we can call a sync queue. So this queue is just going to lead to other parts of our system with our augmented data. Okay, so we've covered stream stream joins where effectively in our consumer, we wanna cache the results of both streams hold on to those and then join them as new events come in. What are we going to do for this? Stream table joins. So stream table joins are exactly what they sound like. Effectively now, what we wanna do instead of just using a stream and a stream is we wanna take the events from one stream that are coming in and actually join them with data that exists in a database table. So what would be another example of doing this? Well, for starters, let's imagine we've got a similar event to last time, right? So we've got search terms, and then let's say we want to actually go ahead and join those with the demographics of the person who is going to be searching. So for example, over here, the primary key is going to be the user ID in both cases. And so we've got this event 
right, from our database. The reason we're actually able to do this is because if you recall from a couple of videos ago, what we can do with databases is something called change data capture. And change data capture is going to serve us in a few ways. The reason being that the naive solution to a stream table join is to forget about this whole thing, right? And instead, every single time that the consumer receives an event, it could make a network call to the database. And that has one main issue, which is that network calls are slow. We don't want to have to query the database every single time we receive an event on our consumer because it's extremely slow. We would rather save much more time, process more events, increase the latency and throughput of our system. And so what we do instead is on our consumer, a better solution would be this guy right here. We keep an in-memory copy of the database table. We actually perform some caching. And that is going to bring up a pretty obvious issue, which is consistency. How do we actually make sure that our in-memory copy of our database table is up to date? Because I might change the demographic info for Jordan. I might have a birthday, and now my age becomes 23 or something. The way we do this, again, is change data cap capture. So a write goes to our database, that's step one. The database propagates that event, step two, to a message broker. And then from there, what's actually going to happen is the message broker can then be consumed by the consumer who can now actually go ahead and update the in-memory copy of the database table. So that when an event is received from our stream, we can actually perform our join and then send it to some outbound queue. And this is going to greatly lower our latency. So using something like change data capture, turning a source of data like a database into effectively another stream allows us to make sure that we're getting the minimum possible latency and the maximum possible throughput in processing all of these stream events. So now we have one more type of join to touch upon, and that is actually going to be table to table joins. Now you may think to yourself, well, why the hell do we need streams for table to table joins? We can already just do that in a SQL database and you would be completely correct. However, the fact of the matter is that database tables change over time, right? And so let's say we wanna make sure that the result of our join is as up to date as possible at all times. Well, if we had a SQL database, the naive solution would just be polling. Every five seconds or something, we run our query. And that's not great for a couple of reasons. For starters, it's not real time, right? We have to periodically run our result. Second of all, that's running a massive query because we're doing a huge join across two tables. Wouldn't it be a lot better if incrementally, as new writes came in, we could just join them with the other table as need be, as opposed to having to redo an entire massive query every few seconds? Well, the answer to that is probably going to be yes. So. What do we do? Well, basically, we can use change data capture twice, which is pretty huge for us. So as you can see, we've got table one over here. We've got table two over here. And every single write that comes in is then going to be propagated to our message brokers, one for each table. And then of course this way what we can do is actually go ahead and cache on our consumer copies of both tables. Now you may think to yourself and you would be correct, well Jordan, what if these tables are too big to be held in memory on a single consumer? Well then we would have to basically do some partitioning where we would split all of our queues into multiple different pieces and then probably we would have to have one consumer per partition. As long as everything is partitioned in the same way, we'll be good to go. So yeah, as you can see, table table joins are a really effective way of making sure that you have up to date join data as the writes actually come in, as opposed to having to run a query on an incremental batch job, which is huge. So what are the patterns that we actually see with stream joins? Well, in all three of those cases that we just mentioned above, there's one main similarity, which is that effectively we've got some sort of state and we are going to cache it in memory on our consumer in memory, generally speaking, because that allows us to have maximum performance. In theory, you could do it on disk, but sometimes this makes things hard for joining uh, unless things are all sorted the same way. So 
Ideally, you would keep things in a hash map on memory and perform joins via a hash join. So this leads us to a couple of issues. And one of them I just touched upon, which is that whenever you're storing things in memory, we've got a whole lot less space on each consumer, which is a problem because our database tables are pretty big, especially if you want to do a stream table or a table table join. And as a result of that, we may have to actually have many, many consumers and many, many partitions of queues where each consumer and each partition of queues are lined up with one another as you know we might expect. So for example, you might have all the A keys on one queue and one consumer, all the B keys on another queue and another consumer, and partition like that somehow. That being said, obviously, that's still just a tough thing to do. It's a lot of things to keep organized. There might be a lot of overhead. And of course, issue number two, again, is that whenever we're keeping all of our data in memory, consumer state is not fault tolerant. Why? Well, because it's in memory. So if a consumer goes down, we lose all of the cache data that it had, and then we would have to somehow get it back, which, you know, depending on the type of message broker that we're using, is not always possible. Even having a write-ahead log isn't necessarily enough. The reason being that we have multiple partitions of consumers, and as a result, even if we're able to bring back our old state on one consumer, the other partitions of consumers might be far ahead of it and have processed more messages, and now they're basically out of sync with one another. So the kind of question is here, well, we have a ton of partitions to manage, and we need to be able to achieve fault tolerance. How can we do it? And that right there is going to be the topic of our next video, which is all about Apache Flink and stateful stream processing solutions. So I will see you guys for the next one. Again, everyone, thank you so much for 10K. Genuinely means a lot to me. Love teaching you guys, love getting good feedback, and I love interacting with you all in the comments. So let's keep it up. I'll see you all soon.